a challenge to grow spiritually. 1 Peter 1 21 through 25 Peter's Epistles number 32 by Dr. Robert D. Luganbill 1 Peter 1 22 through 25 Having now sanctified your hearts by means of obeying the truth, love one another resolutely, so that your brotherly love may be without hypocrisy. For you have been born again not from corruptible seed, but through the word of God which lives and abides forever. Because as it says, Isaiah chapter 40 verse 6 and 48, All flesh is like grass, and all of its glory is like the flowers grass produces. Grass dries up, and its flowers fall to the ground. But the word of the Lord abides forever. This is the word of good news which has been given to you. Introduction Before proceeding to the exegesis of the individual verses, it should be pointed out that the overarching theme of these four verses is the need for believers to continue the good approach and procedure that led to salvation after being saved in order to grow progress and produce for the Lord. We have now been made holy in God's eyes, have been sanctified by the truth, positional sanctification, saved by grace through believing the gospel, and it behooves us hereafter to proceed with our Christian walk in the same way, pursuing experiential sanctification through believing and applying the same word of God, so that our behavior in our walk with Christ and our production in serving His body the Church might be in accord with the wonderful position we now have as those who are in Christ. The same seed of the Word which saved us is the very Word of God to which we must now continue to give our close attention to fulfill the Lord's will for our lives. For everything else in this world which is not the truth will be done away with, but the Word of God abides forever. We too shall abide forever with our dear Lord, because we have been born again through that same Word of God, and we will enjoy forever the rewards we have won through continued attention to and application of the Word in our lives after salvation. But with respect to the progress you have made, keep on advancing in the same way, that is, through receiving, believing, and applying the truth. Philippians chapter 3, verse 16 So then, exactly as you originally received Christ Jesus as your Lord, be walking in Him in the very same way, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith just as you were taught, overflowing with thanksgiving. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7 Sanctified Hearts We have seen before that sanctification and holiness, theological synonyms, are all about separation from sin and evil. God is perfect and absolutely separate from sin and evil, and so it behooves those who are called by His name to be so as well. We are sanctified, made holy, in a positional way when we believe in Jesus Christ. When we are born again, God considers us holy, sanctified and set apart from the world as those who now belong to Him and His Son forever. Naturally, at the point of salvation, we are not divested of the sin nature which infests our present temporary bodies. For that reason, we will not be completely free of sin, in fact, until this corruption puts on incorruption at the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15.53 The fulfillment of that blessed hope at the return of our dear Lord will constitute our ultimate sanctification when we will be forevermore absolutely holy just as our Lord is. In between salvation and eternity, here in the devil's world, it is incumbent upon every believer to pursue sanctification, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, 2 Corinthians 7.1. This is called theologically experiential sanctification, the day-by-day -day pursuit of holiness in which every believer in Jesus Christ ought to be engaged. As we have seen before, however, this holiness we are to develop and manifest to the world is not merely a matter of appearances. It cannot be merely an act, or as our passage puts it, hypocritical, as it was for the Pharisees in the past, and is today for all manner of legalistic groups. Hypocrisy, a Greek-derived word, means, etymologically, play-acting. Rather, true sanctification is the development of a life pleasing to the Lord arising out of a genuine love for Him. Further, we have also seen that such real sanctification, as opposed to merely apparently holy behavior, cannot be achieved simply by working on our outside, in the manner of the Pharisees whom our Lord called whitewashed tombs, 
or in the manner of legalistic groups which eschew only certain obvious behaviours, which may not even be sinful in some cases, while not really changing the inner man. Genuine godly sanctification and true holiness can only be developed from the inside out, never from the outside in. To be truly holy we have to walk very closely with the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is only possible through spiritual growth, through learning the truth of the Word of God, through believing it with all our hearts, and then through applying it in the Spirit to our daily walk. This is why Peter makes a point here in verse 22 of specifying the place of true sanctification, your hearts, and also the means by which the recipients of his letter had already done so, by obeying the truth, namely, because only by changing on our inside in our hearts are we pursuing genuine sanctification, and this can only be done by learning, believing, and applying the word of God and its truths to our lives. I have given them your word, and the world hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. For they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. So make them holy, that is, sanctified, by means of your truth, your word is truth. And just as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. I am consecrating myself for their sake, so that they too may be made holy, that is, be sanctified through truth. John chapter 17, verse 14 through 19. All who originally heard Peter's letter read to them were no doubt believers, and so at the very least they had had their hearts sanctified positionally when born again. But that is not the end for believers in this life. We are left here after salvation for a purpose, and it is for this reason that Peter exhorts his readers on to the next phase of the Christian life, spiritual progress in our walk with the Lord through the fulfilling of the greatest commandment, that of love, 1 Corinthians 1 13, 13. Love one another resolutely, so that your brotherly love may be without hypocrisy. As our Lord tells us in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 through 40, the entire law and all the prophets hang on the greatest commandment, namely, to love the Lord with all of our hearts. He also tells us in that same context that the second commandment, essentially its counterpart, is loving our neighbors preeminently our fellow believers, as ourselves. In his exhortation here to virtuous love, Peter puts the emphasis on our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ, that is, Philadelphia, brotherly love, clear also from love one another, rather than on our love for the Lord. That is because, as his fellow apostle John tells us, whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. If we are going to manifest the primary virtue of loving the Lord with all that is in us, loving our brothers and sisters in Christ is an absolute prerequisite. This love for one another, our fellow believers in Christ, should not be and really cannot be just an act, just for show, performed only in hypocrisy. To make it clear that a large part of what he means by this is that genuine love for our brothers and sisters in Jesus cannot be mere passive lip service, Peter adds in his command for us to love one another, that we do so resolutely, Greek, ektenos, or stretch to the limit. It may appear loving to say to someone in need, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, James chapter 2 verse 16, but as James tells us, there is no profit in such empty words. So what Peter is telling us here is not so much how to handle our attitudes towards our fellow Christians, although that is certainly a part of it. His real emphasis in giving us this exhortation is focused on having us put our money where our mouth is, so to speak. In the example from James, this would mean actually helping a brother or sister in material need. 